it might it might be determined by a pastor it might be determined by a tradition but truly the best way to know who god is is to read the bible and to discover for yourself who who the nature of god is and the the god in the old testament is exactly the same god in the new testament in fact in the book of malachi it says that i am the lord and i never change i've never changed okay so god is the same god who was in the garden with adam and eve is the same god that was manifest in, the, in his son christ and it's the same god that is today it's the same god that will judge the nations god has never changed and god's requirements for man will never change god is a god that is uh, pleased primarily through faith uh, without faith you can't please god and in fact that's how the uh, the saints in the old testament that's how they were sanctified and that's how they were saved uh, so god has never changed okay, anybody that wants to tell you that the way that you know the way that god functions the way that god operates is different uh, now that we're in the new testament then that person uh, probably not intentionally but that person is wrong God, God will never change and God has never changed. And that's why even myself, you know, I was speaking to a friend yesterday and asked me, what, do you eat pork? I said, I don't eat pork. The person said, why do you not eat pork? I said, because in the Old Testament, the Bible says it's an unclean food. So why, why, why is it that now Christ has come, it's suddenly a clean food? Why would that change? It's, it, God would have called it an unclean food for a purpose. There must be something bad about it. And I'm... You know, the Bible says that to enter into the kingdom of God, you have to be like a child. So I'm not going to overcomplicate things. I'm just going to receive and read the Bible for what it says. But what, what we need to do is we need to go back to the Bible. Okay, so your pastor may have told you this. You, you may have uh, watched something on YouTube. You know, you may have learned something, but not everything that you learn is right. Okay, what is right is what is in the Bible. And therefore, for you to really have a strong relationship with God, you need to have a relationship with the Bible. You need to re be reading the Bible regularly so you can find out these things for yourself. Okay? And that, that's how, uh, you know, I look at my journey before I even entered into a church. I, I'd, I'd come to Christ for about maybe nine months or so, been reading the Bible before somebody told me you should go to a church, you should fellowship. I went to a fellowship. And I went to different churches. And then I recognized I started to learn a lot of things that were just not in the Bible. And even now, I'm still learning about God. Because my, my faith is in the word of God. My faith is not in man. I don't trust man. It's, it's not wise to trust man. So why put so much trust and faith in somebody that says something that is different to the Bible? If you are going to believe somebody, at least believe somebody that that preaches the bible at least believe in somebody that teaches directly from the bible okay and that's why we have to have that due diligence to search the scriptures to see if what i'm saying is true to see if what a pastor is saying is true we need to go into the scriptures ourselves and discover that for ourselves you know, the bible says that in the last days there will be many that say that I am Christ, I am Christ. What does that mean? That means that there'll be a lot of people saying, I'm Christian, I'm a Christian. <laughs> there will be loads of people. The Bible says it. it, when, it when it says many will say that I am Christ, do you know what Christ means? Christ means anointed. That's Christ is, Christ is a title. So what, what Jesus is saying is Jesus is saying that many will come in that day, in the last day, saying, I'm anointed, I'm a Christian, I am of Christ. But the Bible says, don't follow them. Don't follow those people. Who should you follow? Follow the Bible. Follow the Lord. Follow Jesus. This is not about uh, the, the importance of any leader. Any leader that God has ordained and anointed is only a servant. Leader, real leaders do not, you know, this is one of the ways you test the spirit. They're asking you for money. They're always asking you for, for something. For me, that's that's not a good sign because I don't see Christ asking people for money. You know, uh, the prophet Samuel, Samuel, and don't get this wrong, because I'm saying that we should not follow man doesn't mean that we should not submit to men. 
does not mean that we shouldn't learn from men because the Bible's clear in Ephesians that God has set forth uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and pastors for the edification of the body of Christ. So even before I've, I've entered into this Bible study today, I'm listening to a teacher online, a teacher that I like. He's teaching, he was teaching about jealousy. He was teaching about, well, as Desmond put here, testing the spirit. And I learned from it. I was edified from it. So it doesn't mean that we separate ourselves entirely. But what it means is that our, the person that we are supposed to follow is Christ. We're supposed to follow Christ. And if somebody's preaching another gospel and what they're saying, it does not line with scripture, then just separate yourself from that person. If that person, if you've tested that person and they do not have the fruit of the spirit, then there's no need to be in association with that person. There is no need to, because if you're, if you're in association with that person, you're not going to grow. You only need to be around people that are going to make you grow. Okay, those are the people that you spend time with. The people that, you know, where the Bible says iron sharpens iron. You need to be with people that make you want to seek God. You need to be with people that make you want to learn more about God. You, there's no point spending time with people that do not improve you. That includes old friends. You, you need to cut people off okay? because so, sometimes you cannot move forward. Sometimes you cannot succeed. You, sometimes God cannot bless you until you cut that person off until you say goodbye to that person and you read about that plenty of times sometimes that's the way that the satan actually attacks people and that's the way that satan brings down people's downfall by association by a wrong association only ask samson the issue with samson consistently from 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 you know a fairly young age is that he was always in wrong association with people many of us when we hear of samson we hear about Delilah, we remember about Delilah, but Delilah wasn't the only woman that, that caused a lot of issues in his life. You know, the first woman he married caused a lot of issue in his life. Samson had married when he was younger. So we have to learn these lessons now when we're young, because if we don't learn these lessons now, the same things will continue to happen, the same attacks, the same things that will bring our downfall, it will continue to happen and we will not be able to move forward. Had Samson learned when he married that one, that young woman, when he was young, then maybe he wouldn't have fallen to Delilah, but he didn't learn his lesson. You see, every single day in life, there's a lesson to be learned. Sometimes, because we keep failing those lessons, God keeps repeating the tests. Every single day, repeating the test until we pass that lesson, pass that test, and then God can, can elevate us and promote us and give us and take us to the next level and then or to the next class and give us another lesson, another test. But we have to be, every single day is an opportunity to learn. And that's what I'm saying as a, as a, as a, a Christian, and I use that term loosely. I personally use that term loosely because it's not a term that Christ even, even used. Christ never used the term Christian Christ didn't come to set up a new religion. As I said to you before, God, the God of the Bible has always been the same God. He didn't just suddenly wake up one day and say, you know what? I'm going to call my people Christians. God, 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 you know, Christian has been used, I think, maybe twice in the Bible. The term Christian, it was used number one by in, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 11 or 12. And it was used of people that were in the church at Antioch. And then uh, Peter uses it once as well. The true term is saints. We are saints. We're the saints of the most high God. That's the true term. That's the true term. Because even within, you say you're a Christian to people, they say, oh, are you a Catholic? Uh, are you a Protestant? Uh, are you a Pentecostal? <laughs> uh, are you a Presbyterian? Oh, are you a Methodist? Oh, I could, I could keep going on. Are you an Anabaptist? Oh, are you a Baptist? Oh, are you uh, charismatic? <laughs> oh, are you, are you um, uh, reformed? Or oh, I've just given you 12 different denominate, at least 12 different denominations of what people would say is Christian. Where none of these terms are in the Bible, what were the people known as? They were known as disciples. What were the people known as? They were known as saints. 
What were the people known as? Children of God, servants of God. That's, that's what I classify myself. I classify myself as a servant of God. There's no, as I said, there's no place in the Bible of all those gospels where you see the term Christian. There's no place in that, in that scripture where you will see Christ saying, I'm a Christian and I've come to set up a new religion. No, Christ said, I've, not, I've come not to destroy the law or the prophets. I've come to fulfill. Christ was a fulfillment of the people that came before him. Christ was a fulfillment of the prophets. Going back from, going back from Noah to Abraham, to Samuel, to David, to Isaiah, Ezekiel, and then finally to John the Baptist. Christ was a fulfillment of all of those prophets. Now, Christ came in the fullness of God. Christ is, is, is greater than all of the prophets that came before him. Christ was a perfect man. But Christ did not come to start something new. Christ came to fulfill. Christ did not come to destroy. Christ came to lead the way. So we as Christians, we follow Christ. We don't follow man. I, you will never, you know, if you see any, any man trying to get them to follow you, then that's a false prophet. There's no Come prophet. on, praise God, man. There's Hallelujah. There's no prophet. Hallelujah prophet in the bible that wanted people to follow them prophets spend time by themselves prophets don't prophets don't spend time with people they they come to people when they're called by god to teach the people because prophets teach the people but prophets and prophets don't want followers remember christ christ um if you, let's look at our first scripture today let me show you how christ responded when people wanted to follow him okay in john I believe it's John chapter 6. Okay, John chapter 6. So, so basically, we won't read all the story, but John, uh, in John chapter 6, uh, there's a few people, a few thousand people following Christ, and they're hungry. They've been following him for a few days. And Christ uh, multiplies bread, and Christ multiplies fish, and then he feeds all the people there. Hey, why, why, why are they following Christ? They're following Christ because Christ is trying to teach them. Okay, Christ's ministry is, is a teaching ministry. Okay, the ministry of a servant of God is a teaching ministry. Children of God are supposed to teach others about the ways of God. Now, of course, God, Jesus Christ did other things, wonderful other things, such as healing people, raising people from the dead. But the reason why he did that it's twofold. I mean, number one, he had compassion upon the people. He loved the people. He didn't want to see them suffer. But number two, he said that you will not believe except you see signs. Because it's, the miracles do not save the people. It's the teachings that save the people. It's, the, it's having faith in the teachings and believing in the teachings and following the teachings that has somebody saved. So you notice the first thing Christ did when he began his ministry after he was baptized by the Spirit he didn't just do miracles straight away and, and show off to the world. The first thing he did is he say, repent. He said, repent, because the kingdom of God is at hand. Because it's repentance that brings salvation. It's not miracles. It's not signs. It's not wonders. Remember, Christ said, many will come to me in that day saying, I've done this miracle. I've prophesied in your name. I've cast out devils in your name. And Christ said, depart from me. I never knew you. So the, the wonders come. The miracles come. The healings come, but Christ did those things so that he could get people to believe in what he was saying. Because who on earth would believe him? He just come out of no ways from Galilee. You know, you read about in, in John chapter one, uh, some of the disciples, because, you know, before Christ had a ministry, uh, the, the main ministry in, in Israel was John the Baptist. And John the Baptist had a number of disciples that were following him. But when Christ came... Many of those disciples left John the Baptist and then they went under, under Christ. And so one of those disciples, um, I think, uh, I'm trying to think who that disciple was. I think the disciple was, um, I think it was Andrew. I believe it was Andrew. And I believe Andrew was the, uh, was the brother of Peter, you know, the apostle Peter. And so Andrew went to Nathaniel, who was a, a disciple of Christ, who would later become a disciple of Christ. 
And he said to, uh, to Nathaniel, he said, we found the Messiah. The man has been prophesied in, in the scripture. He's finally here. And Nathaniel said, can, a, can any good thing come out of Galilee? You know, Galilee was, was not a nice place. It was a place where no real spiritual figure had come from Galilee. Most of them, because you see in Israel, you have a northern part of Israel. And you have a southern part of Israel. And many of the prophets in, in Israel come from the south. Okay, many of them come from Levi. Okay, many of them come from Judah. Many of them come from Benjamin. Okay, you, you read about uh, um, the main prophets like uh, Ezekiel, Isaiah, uh, Daniel. Most of them are from Judah. Okay, even in the, the New Testament. Okay, and this is why I'm such a, a firm believer that you have to understand the God of Israel for you to really e even understand Christ. If you come into Christ and you're trying to put your own Christian stance, your own, your own Western stance on who God is, God is going to reject you. Okay, you need to, you need to go back to the old, the old Testament and learn about who God is because he's the God of Israel. Okay, so, um, you know, even in the New Testament, okay, Christ was from Judah. Okay, Paul was from Benjamin. He's from the southern part of, of Israel. Peter from Judah. Matthew, the guy that wrote the gospel of Matthew, he was from Levi. He was a Levite from the south. So Jesus was, Jesus was raised in the northern part of Israel. So Nathaniel said, can a good thing come out of, of, of uh, Galilee? You know, when Christ was teaching, he said, this guy, he's the son of a carpenter. We know his parents. Who, who is he? So the reason why Christ was doing the miracles is to get people to believe. Because, you know, we, you know, what does it say? It says that the, the Greeks see, seek wisdom. First Corinthians chapter one or two it says the Greeks seek a wisdom, but the Jews seek a sign. In other words, the Jewish people, they're, they're, uh, they're supernatural people. They're people that believe in supernatural things. And they're not going to believe in your testimony unless you have some form of proof. And this is why I've seen even in, in my ministry, in the ministry of others, I think I was even meditating about it today. Um, some of the brothers that I've done evangelism with, you know, there's a guy called uh, Brother Benjamin, who you may know. And Benjamin is probably one of the most supernatural people I've met, to be honest. And when I when we would do evangelism with Benjamin, the guy would would be healing everybody he touched. And I'm not I, I'm not here to to make this up or to uh you know, to try and get you to believe it. it's just the truth. The guy, every person he would lay hands on, it was headache, arthritis, uh, something broken, something swollen. He would lay hands on people and they would get healed. And people would now be open to Christ. You know, people would now receive the message that Christ is the Lord. So that is why God uses healing. But as I was saying earlier on, the main, re the main reason why we're here is to teach. We're not here called, we're not called exclusively just to heal, okay? If your ministry is all about healing and there's no teaching, then I, I, I have to question how powerful is your, is your ministry, okay? Because you can heal somebody from cancer and you heal that person from cancer and that person from cancer departs from the Lord and lives a rebellious life and disobeys the commandments of God and that person will still go to hell. That person will go to hell. Or you could teach somebody about the ways of God and that person has cancer, but that person doesn't get held, but that person repents and comes to the Lord with a contrite heart and that person will receive eternal life. So it's, it's the teachings that save people's lives. And this is why I'm saying it's so important for us to know the Bible so we can teach people. Many people have questions to ask. That I've met Muslims that know the Bible more than Christians. Honestly, I've met Muslims that read the Bible and they, obviously they read it so that they can, they can argue against it. But I've met Muslims that have better, that understand the God of the Bible more than, than people that claim to be Christians. And this is what I'm saying. Like, how can we, we can't say that we are the disciples, we're the, we're the chosen of God, if, if we have a lack of knowledge what did what did hosea say the prophet said my people perish because of a lack of knowledge 
what, did, what does Paul say? Paul says, study to show thyself approved unto God. So when I'm studying, I'm doing so so that God is going to approve of me, so that God is going to like me, <laughs> so that God will be like, okay, well done, my son. Okay, we, we don't study to impress people around us. We don't study uh, to be approved of men. We study to be approved of God. And then when we study, God gives us wisdom, okay, about the scriptures, okay? Remember, the Bible says wisdom is the principal thing, but wisdom only comes, wisdom comes through studying the Bible. You can gain wisdom as an old man because you've gone through many, you've gone through a lot of mistakes, you've made many experiences, you know, old people tend to be wise, not all old people, but some old people are wise because of the experiences that they've gone through. But you can learn about all of their experiences by just reading the Bible and obeying it because the Bible teaches you certain things that you should do and certain things that you shouldn't do. And the reality is if you, if you know, and I've learned that if you choose to do things contrary to the Bible, you're going to find out and learn the hard way. But if you just listen to what the Bible says and does what the, and do what the Bible says, then, then you will grow. You will grow. Not, uh, not all, bro. That's a lie. They, they think they know. Their, sorry, they think they know they know what their itching is. Want to hear? Yeah. Amen. Amen. So <laughs> sorry, I've been ranting. I haven't even started the teaching. Haven't gone through any of the scriptures, but we can save that. If I don't finish today, we'll go through that on Saturday. Um, but as I said, we need to be focusing on holiness. I think I was just ranting for about 20 minutes about going back to the Bible, reading the Bible. And, it's, and I'm, I'm going to continue for a little bit. It's because I'm realizing that we as a people, we as the saints, we need to prioritize this Bible. Amen. And we need to prioritize it and receive it with an open mind. That means sometimes we have to unlearn things. I've had to unlearn many things. Things that I was taught that were not in line with the scriptures. You have to be humble to, to be used by God. Who are we? Some of us, none of us here has lived above 70 years, 60 years. No, no one here is above the age of 60. We haven't. Is that things like the Trinity? Well, Desmond, I, I, I for one will always tell you that I there's no Trinity in the Bible. Okay, people can tell me, oh, but it's, this says this, this says that, but there's no one mention of the term Trinity in the Bible. I've got a Bible here that has 1,393 pages and there's not a single men, you will not find the word Trinity in the Bible once. And that those are one of the things that, I was introduced to in the in the in the the Roman Catholic Church. In the Roman Catholic Church, yeah, I don't I don't see any mention of the Roman Catholic Church in the Bible either. This is what I'm saying. Many people are learning religion but not learning the Bible, and people get upset. But if they're being honest with themselves, they need to ask themselves: When last did they go into the Bible? When last did they read the Bible? Okay, when when last did you spend? Did you spend weeks on weeks reading the Bible, reading the Bible every single day, learning the Bible? Or is it that you just went to church on Sunday? Some people don't like to hear this, but it's the truth. It's the truth. And it's all right, Brother Desmond. What I said, Desmond, is that we have to be honest with ourselves and ask ourselves what we know about God. Has it been told, by, told to us by us going to church on a Sunday? Or is it the case that we're actually seeking God, we're actually reading the Bible and trying to learn for ourselves? Because many of us, what we do is we put God to the side, we focus on all the other things, we focus on the work, we focus on jobs, we focus on our relationship with other people, and then we think that we can just go to God's presence one day a week for one hour, and God is going to be happy with that. Or even, even if God is happy with that, I'm not, who am I to judge? Even if God is happy with that, the question is how, how much more could you know of God if you said to yourself, okay, I'm not just going to do one hour a week, but actually my life is not going to revolve around work and revolve around money and revolve around relationships with people. My life is actually now going to revolve around serving the Lord. 
And I know that if I want to serve the Lord properly, I really need to know the Bible. To, do, to be able to be a representative of God. It's like, it's like if you want to be a lawyer, you, 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 you learn. <laughs> you learn the laws of the land. You spend four, five, even more years. And even once you become a lawyer, you're still learning. I'm a teacher. For me to teach economics, I'm a teacher of economics. I studied economics for two years in sixth form. I then went to university and studied economics at university. This is going back. I studied at university, started in 2011, more than 10 years ago. Graduated around nine years ago. I've been teaching since then. I'm still learning economics. I'm still asking my students, as I did today, I'm asking my students certain questions about economics because I'm learning from them. I'm still learning. I'm still reading because there's still so much more to learn about the subject economics. But what, how much more the things of God? The lawyers are learning, the doctors are learning, the teachers are learning. How much more God? There's so, like God, everything in this world is all about God. So there's so much to learn about him. And what I'm saying is that if we put God to, you know, in a box and we say, okay, Sunday, uh, you know, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. is the time or, you know, whatever time people go to church, Sunday, 11 a.m., whatever time it is, this is when I know about God, then we're really, really limiting ourselves as to how much more we can know. And as a result, we won't be able to represent him to the best of our ability. You know what, you know what the Bible says in Acts, the, the book of Acts says that you shall, let, let me get the scripture Jesus said to the apostles. Acts, the book of Acts. Acts chapter, Acts chapter 1, verses 8. It says, and this is Christ speaking, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be witnesses. Witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem. He didn't say you shall be Christians unto me in both Jerusalem. He said you shall be witnesses. Witness. To, wit to be a witness, that means you have experienced Christ. You've experienced God. So what I'm saying is how can we be witnesses of Christ if we don't spend that time with him, if we don't spend that time in the word of God? Remember, the Bible says in the beginning, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The people that wrote these scriptures were holy men the people that wrote these scriptures were men that would fast for 40 days they don't eat food they don't eat water they don't drink water all they do is pray 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 people like moses you see, i see i have see people today they have the cheek to dismiss moses they have the cheek to dismiss the writings of moses the writings of the apostles these were men that did not live for themselves. They lived for Christ. Everything they did, how do they drive fast for that long? Look, you know, there's a story of Moses. When you read the, um, the book of Exodus, you're introduced to the Ten Commandments. Um, Moses, um, Moses spent, once they received those commandments, Moses spent 40 days in, in, the, in the mountain with the Lord. Because you know the book of Genesis, you know the first five books, including the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis came to us from Moses. Moses is the man that wrote the book of Genesis. And actually, when he was on that mountain fasting and praying and seeking the face of God, God gave him the instruction, gave him the vision. Moses was on that mountain. He was seeing Abraham. He was seeing Isaac. He was seeing Jacob. He was seeing Noah. He was, see he was seeing Abel. He was seeing Cain. They People didn't know about those things until Moses received them from the Lord from the angel of the Lord on the mountain. You know what happened? Moses was there for 40 days. The word of the Lord came to him and said, go down, you the people that you, you, you brought out from Egypt. They're, they're playing the whore. So he went down. They were serving a, a foreign god. They're all committing fornication, drinking, eating, for tomorrow we'll die, dancing. You know, Moses got angry. 
Many of them were killed that day. And then you know what Moses did? He went back onto the mountain again and he did another 40 days. I don't know if that man, if he broke his fast when he came down. But all I know is that he did 40 days, came down, rebuked the people, and he did another 40 days. No water, no food. This guy did about 80 days of fasting. When he then came down after the, the next 40 days, the Bible says that his face was shining and he didn't know his face was shining, that the people were scared. His face was shining like the sun. He said they had to get a, cl a cloak and put it over his face because the people were scared. He was so in the presence of the Lord. And, that's, and that is how people are able to fast for 40 days because supernaturally there are angels that are strengthening them. That, you know, Elijah, did, Elijah when he, read, he, he fled from um, Jezebel, he was in the wilderness. An angel came, gave him some bread, told him to eat it. It's the Bible says he went off the strength of that bread, 40 days, 40 nights, until he got into Mount Horeb. And in fact, Mount, Mount Horeb, is, is, this is all great because it's all links with one another, but Mount Horeb is the same place that Moses was, the, the same mountain that Moses was when God was with him, speaking to him. So Elijah went to Mount Horeb of the strength of that bread because there are angels that can give you supernatural strength can give you supernatural grace. Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, read it in the book of Luke, Gospel of Luke. The Bible says that he was praying, he was praying, he was praying, that he was praying so hard that he started to sweat blood. Something was happening to him spiritually. And the Bible says an angel came down from heaven. This is in the New Testament. An angel came down from heaven and touched him and strengthened him. Strengthened because Christ was already in so much pain before he even started, you know, before they even arrested him, before they to torture him, he was already in so much anguish. So he, he the angel came and touched him and strengthened him. And he went from, from the from the source of that strength, he was able to face everything he faced, even onto the cross. You know, Christ, when he was on the on the cross, there were some people came to him and they wanted to give him some sort of concoction, some herbal concoction. And this herbal concoction would enable him to withstand the pain. And Christ said, no. He said that the cup that the father has given me, I will drink it. I don't need your concoction. I don't need your drugs. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to face this cross. Because he had the strength that the angels of God, the holy angels of God can give you strength. You see, the holy angels of God give you strength. They can give you wisdom. They can give you revelation. You'll be having dreams. You'll be having visions. The angel of the Lord is, is helping you. So that, in, in response to your question, um, Desmond, that's how people do, do 40 days. But of course, you, one only does 40 days if they are led by the Spirit to do so. You don't do things like that unless in some way you felt led by God to, to, to fast that long because Christ did 40 days. You see, remember, Christ was in the, was in the wilderness for 40 days. And who was with him in the wilderness? This is what I'm saying about angels. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4. Verses 11. Then the, so this is after he. I'll read from verses 1 so you can see the context. Then was Jesus led by the spirit into the wilderness. Okay, so he, he went to the wilderness because he was led. Okay, when we do things, we have to be led by the Spirit to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And then we know about the temptations of the devil. Christ rebuked him. Okay, the devil knew the word of God. The devil does know the word of God. The ministers of Satan that are here today also know the word of God. As I said, people knowing the word, memorizing the word of God. This is why we have to know the word. If Satan knows the word of God and these ministers know the word of God, how on earth will we be able to discern anything if we don't know the word of God? We need to know the word of God as well before we can even develop that discernment to be able to say, okay, this one's not necessarily from God. And that's why many people are deceived because they don't know the word of God. Verse 11, then the devil leaves him and behold, angels come and ministered unto him. Okay, that term minister means serve. 
So you read in Hebrews chapter one, for instance, it talks about the role of angels. Hebrews chapter one, verses 13. Hebrews 1 verses 13, it says, but to which of the angels said God at any time sit on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Okay, so the author is talking about Christ and how Christ is above every name and how Christ is is greater than the angels. That God never said to Michael or to Gabriel, sit on my right hand. I'm going to give you the kingdoms. But God said this to Christ. God said to Christ, sit on my right hand and I will avenge you of all your enemies. Verse 14, are not all ministering spirits, he's talking about angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them that shall be the hearers of salvation? Okay, so angels are servants. They're like serving, they serve us. In many ways, in many ways, and actually, that there, there can be a level of spirituality that we can attain to, most likely through through holiness, uh, living in obediently to God, and through much fasting and praying. There's a level we can attain to that we become very receptive to these angels, very receptive to these spirits. Some of them will be able to speak to you audibly, and it might sound far fetched. In the book of Acts, uh, there was a holy evangelist by the name of Philip. And the Bible says the angel told him to go to the desert. He was led by an angel into the desert. And I mean, how many of us would go if we heard a voice saying, go to the desert? Many of us wouldn't go. But Philip had discerned that it was the angel of the Lord. So he must have had interaction with this angel for some time. Because we all have angels. We all have Some of us have specific angels, okay? And sometimes these angels can can be moving between different people, depending upon your call. But I I believe we also have guardian angels. I believe that there, there should be an angel, at least one angel assigned specifically to an individual. Now, there are other high ranking angels that work between different people. So, for instance, and again, this is all in the scriptures. Everything I'm saying is in the scriptures. Gabriel went to John the ba- John the Baptist's mom and dad and told them, prophesied to them, that Elizabeth, who was barren, would give birth to a boy that would be a prophet, John the Baptist. That same Gabriel then went to uh, Mary, the mother of Christ, and gave him good gave her good tidings and told her that she was going to give birth to a son that will save the world so you see gabriel there gabriel is not necessarily assigned to one person but gabriel as a high-ranking angel is is sent by god to deliver strong prophetic messages to people that have strong callings on their lives so some angels they they go as as not as they please but they go as they're led by god god tells them because you see god, the way that god deals with people is you is through intermediaries god is holy god is king god is the king so god has servants and god sends those servants to do the will of god just like god sends me or god sends any other disciple god god sends intermediaries to do his because he's a king there's no king that does everything by himself no the king he's the king <laughs> so he has people that work for him and do and and listen to him and obey him and 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 teach what he wants to teach and so that's what the angels are many times when people experience god in the old testament and in the new testament often it was an angel of the lord that they saw even christ think of christ christ is a, is a servant of the lord Christ is a a minister of the Most High. He is the Son of God. He is an intermediary between man and God. And let's let's and this is you know this is why I, I I preach who Christ really is. I don't preach some you know Catholic view of who you know God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is. I, we have to read what the Bible says. 
you know, about who, who Jesus is. Jesus is a man. Okay? Jesus Christ is a, is a man. God, I'm sorry to be so uh, forthright and so maybe coming across a bit sarcastic, but God is, because we don't know these things, okay? So it's unfair for me to be like that, but God is, God is not a man. Jesus Christ is a man. And that's pretty clear because Jesus was born from a woman and Jesus died. It's not possible for God to die. God is a spirit. Spirits don't die. Amen, Desmond. God is a spirit. God is not, a, is a, is not like us, okay? <laughs> God is not like us. We're, we are like God because God made us in his image and in his likeness. But we, we, a God is not like us. <laughs> we are like him. We were made in his likeness, okay? Um, but Christ hungered. Christ uh, wept. Christ was sad. Christ was very much human. But Christ, Christ was the man that God chose to dwell in. So when you speak to Christ, it's like you're speaking to God because the Holy, because Christ is so full of the Holy Ghost. He's so full of the spirit of God that is basically not even a man speaking to you anymore. It's a man you will see physically, but God, the almighty creator is in him, using him as a vessel to manifest himself to his people. That's how you understand Christ. Christ is a mediator. First Timothy chapter two. First Timothy chapter two. Verses five. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Amen. I'll read that one more time. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we've explored this several times, but Christ has a God and that God is our God. It's the same God. We all serve the same God, the Father and Lord of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to close there because of time. Guys, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming. Um,